In this video, we're going to introduce the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now, the uncertainty principle is one of the most important consequences of quantum mechanics, one of its greatest discoveries. And the statement of the uncertainty principle is that it is impossible to specify simultaneously with arbitrary precision, precision both the momentum and position of a particle, right? So if you're interested in the momentum and position of a particle, then it is impossible to know them both with an arbitrary degree of certainty, right? So if you wanted to know with 100% certainty, both the position and momentum of a moving particle, it is impossible. And this holds true uh, whether we're talking about microscopic or macroscopic particles, as we'll see soon, um, an example uh, that we'll go through, even in a macroscopic world, there's some uncertainty uh, with, with these moving particles. It's just negligible. But in the quantum realm, where we're dealing with really small particles, it is going to be sizable. Right? Now, we actually saw this with the momentum, right? If we, uh, if we had a, a free particle wave function, then we knew that, you know, it would uh, produce a certain momentum, right? We knew that the momentum is definitely going to be kh bar, right? We knew that its its magnitude would be, be kh bar, but its position is completely unknown, right? It'd be moving to the left or to the right. It would depend on the observation, right? But we knew the magnitude with certainty, but as far as the uh, position or its, you know, movement, it was unpredictable. And that was because we had those two different superpositions of functions, right? Um, so let's talk about kind of the opposite of that. So we know that if we know the momentum with 100% certainty, we kind of lose a little bit of information about the location. Let's, what if we wanted to know the location with an arbitrary certain uh, precision and what would happen to our understanding of the momentum? Let's look at this example. So, uh, so on the left here, I have what would the wave function would look like if we knew the location of the particle exactly. So on the x-axis, we have position and the y-axis is our wave function. So what this wave function would look like is a wave function that spiked right at the location of our particle and is zero literally everywhere else, right? So it spiked right at that location where the particle is located and it is zero literally everywhere else. Now, how do we actually build a wave function that looks like this? Well, what we would have to do is to keep adding more and more functions that are centered at that location X, right? So that's what I've drawn here on the right-hand side. So there's the same uh, axes, the Y-axis is the wave function and the X-axis is position. The, uh, the graph that I have at the top, this green one, is if you had two functions a part of the superposition that are centered around the location of the particle, right? You can see that it's just you get one uh, type of sine wave, uh, you know, one little amplitude here uh, that stretches out across this entire axis that we've been given here, right? If you add more functions, then you start to approximate more this uh, this this type of function that we see on the left where it's spiked at one location and zero everywhere else. If you have like five different parts of this, uh, different functions in a the superposition, then you'll have a little bit less of a wave function where the particle is not located and a large spike where it is located. If we had 21 different uh, functions a part of it, you would have even less of a wave function further away from the, the particle's position and a larger spike there, right? And so on and so forth. And you can continue to do this until you add an infinite number of, uh, of functions to the sum. So I've kind of written each one out as a summation, right? For if we have two functions, then you're basically summing two different uh, functions as a part of the superposition. Each one will be a different state. It'll have a different coefficient in front of it. Same thing if you do five or if you do 21, right? But think about what we're doing here. If every single function refers to a different state, a different possible momentum, right? In, in, our, in our free particle wave function, we only had two. One is the particle going to the left, one is the particle going to the right, right? If you continue to add on more and more functions, you add on more and more possibilities of momentum states to the point where if you add an infinite number of functions to this sum, then you have an infinite number of possibilities of momentum states. You won't know which one it possibly is. Even if you know the location 
of this particle with 100% certainty, you've now added on more and more different possibilities of momentum states, right? So if you know the location of the particle, you now become completely ignorant of the momentum. Just like we saw before, if you know the momentum, then you're completely ignorant of the location of that particle. Now, there's a quantitative way to uh, to state Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right? So the equation that defines this, the equation for the principle, is the following, right? So we'll have delta rho, where this is the uncertainty in the momentum, delta Q, which is the uncertainty in the position. So the uncertainty in momentum times the uncertainty in position is gonna be greater than or equal to one half H bar. Right now, basically all this is saying is that the product of these two uncertainties, there is a minimum uncertainty associated with the product of these two, right? So let me, um, let me actually annotate this so we will have it here. So this is the uncertainty in momentum. And this is uncertainty in position, right? So the product of these two uncertainties can never be zero, right? Um, it has to be a greater than or equal to H bar over two, right? So there's a, a minimum uncertainty associated with this product. So what this is telling you, right? So let's say, for example, that we were 100% certain about the momentum, right? That means that delta rho would be equal to zero, right? If delta rho is equal to zero, right? Or, or you know, approximately equal to zero, then that means that delta Q, right? Our change in the position, our change in the position would be infinite. Right, because to accommodate for this very low value in the uncertainty and momentum, the uncertainty in position is going to shoot up. And the same thing if we had a near zero uncertainty in the position, the uncertainty in the momentum is going to shoot up. Right, so n neither of these can actually be zero. There's always going to be some latent uncertainty in each one, and it's a trade off. The more you know about the momentum, the less you know about the position. The more you know about the position, the less you know about the momentum. And this is an inherent trait of quantum mechanics, an inherent property of quantum mechanics. Okay, so that introduces the uncertainty principle. In the next video, I'm going to go through an example and show why um, the uncertainty principle is important at the quantum level, but not so important in our macroscopic world.